Welcome. We're almost at the end of the conference. We've heard a lot of great talks this week with a lot of references to scale, uptime, resiliency, words I'm sure you're all very familiar with. I'm sure you'll agree that the entire technology industry and certainly this conference are built on the idea that automation is key. Today, I'm going to challenge that assumption. With increasing automation, you can begin to lose control. In the financial industry, a single small oversight can bring down your whole company. Today, I'm going to share a different perspective on SRE, how sometimes building to fail is the right choice. My name's Gillian Hawker, and I work at Optivert as an SRE in our Amsterdam office. I've worked in technology in various sectors of the financial industry for the last 12 years. Actually, it was at the last SRE con that I first met Optivert, so I'm excited to be sitting here with you today. How often do you think about the importance of the role of failure? Have you considered the impact a minor mistake could have on your company? Let me share my slides with you. In the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about three things. Understanding your trading environment. In order to design a production system, you must understand your company's core business. Secondly, experiencing disaster. I'll share with you a story about how a small mistake led to one company's downfall. And lastly, mitigating the risk. How can we avoid these mistakes? Let's start with the trading environment. Most of you probably know at a high level how trading works, but today we're going to focus on electronic market makers such as Optiba. I'll not go into too much detail, but as our business model is tightly coupled to the design of our production system, I promise this is all relevant to the rest of the talk. There are three things you need to understand when talking about electronic market making. First, what is a market maker? Market makers like Optiba provide prices to public stock exchanges on which they're willing to trade. For anyone who's ever bought foreign currency before going on holiday, the principle is the same. The foreign exchange counter will give you a price at which they will buy or sell, exchange, your currency for euros, pounds, dollars, or whatever it is you want to buy. They're making a market for your currency. Second, stock exchanges need market makers. Exchanges rely on market makers to provide competitive pricing of the products they're offering. For example, some market makers have agreements under which they're obligated to provide prices for certain periods. This helps um, the exchanges ensure there's enough liquidity in the market to be able to trade on fair prices. Fewer market makers means fewer prices for your currency exchange. Today, exchanges are electronic. Exchanges have become increasingly automated over the years and the open outcry trading pits of the past you might have seen in films uh, have mostly been replaced by server racks in data centers. We can submit an order electronically and have it executed in ever decreasing fractions of a second. Traders control all of this from their desks. I'm sure you can relate to some of the challenges and environment of this scale poses. Now you understand a bit more about electronic trading, I'm going to tell you about Opta's, Optiva's market making environment. This is important to understand as it's key to the business model of any electronic trading company. This might be a bit different to the setups you're used to. We use physical hosts for trading, no clouds or VMs, mainly for latency purposes. This means we spend a lot of time thinking about our high level architecture, which I'll go through now. In order to be able to exchange, trade on an exchange, such as this one, we first need to be able to connect to the exchange's network, which we can do from specific data centers. Optiva trades on over 60 exchanges all over the world with offices in Amsterdam, Sydney, Chicago, and London. So we have a presence in multiple data centers globally. Exchanges are all different and have their own protocols and rules. So externally facing applications are coded to the relevant protocol. Internally, we define our own protocols to allow us to standardize our applications as much as possible. On the most competitive exchanges, a nanosecond can be the difference between having an order executed or not. We use FPGAs or programmable integrated circuits to help us achieve those speeds, which are apparently little yellow things. So now we have the hardware to trade, what else do we need? Up-to-date market information from exchanges is crucial for generating good prices. We've built a global information network that consists of mainly fiber and also some microwave connections, fast dissemination of data. 
As I'm sure you can imagine, this quickly builds up to a complex picture of data centers and feeds that's all managed by our SREs. In total, we move about 230 terabytes of data a day across some 1500 global servers. I'm sure by now you're wondering where the failure part comes in. Overlooking all of this setup is our automated control framework. This is crucial to allow us to function safely in a high speed environment. Applications are built with functions to gracefully shut down if they experience any unexpected behavior. We don't carry on while we figure out what went wrong, we shut down and investigate. Additionally, we have both virtual and physical kill switches in place in order to be able to force trading to stop if we need to. So now we under, understand the trading environment, we can talk about what happens when things go wrong. I don't think it's possible to talk about technical failure in the financial industry without mentioning Knight Capital. I'm sure some of you have heard of them before, but for you, those of you who haven't, Knight Capital was a financial services firm that engaged in, among other things, electronic market making, using high frequency algorithms to trade on public exchanges. On what started out as a normal Wednesday back in August 2012, Knight Capital lost $460 million in 45 minutes. The root cause was an incorrectly deployed upgrade of their automated trading system. At the time of the incident, they were the largest trader of US equities, but still managed to become the example in the industry of what can happen when technology isn't properly orchestrated. The incident was investigated and detailed in a report by the US financial regulatory body, the SEC. According to this report, here's what happened. The engineer performing the deployment included only seven of the eight application servers the new code was supposed to be rolled out to. An old flag was repurposed in this upgrade, which activated old dead code still deployed on the eighth server. Checks on the cumulative quantity of orders being sent out had been removed from the old code and placed elsewhere. The component running on old code submitted millions of orders, generating a total position of seven and a half billion dollars in 45 minutes. Of the 154 stops that were impacted by this activity, Knight made up more than 50% of the trading volume during that time and generated price moves of more than 10%. After the incident, Knight sold off the positions generated by this uncontrolled trading activity, realizing a loss of $460 million. These are all scary things, right? An incomplete release, dead code, a repurposed flag, uncontrolled order submission behavior impacting the stock market. How often have you found old code and thought, hmm, I'll clean that up later? While concerning, for me, the events that led to the failure are not the main characters in the story. Failures happen and always will. But if Knight had simply stopped trading when disaster struck, we wouldn't be here talking about them today. When you're dealing with fast moving financial markets where nanoseconds count, the safest thing you can do in the event of any unexpected behavior is simply to stop and stop as quickly as possible. The potential downside is far too big to risk continuing to trade in such an environment. This is why we fail hard. How do you usually think about failure in your role as SREs? SRE principles tell us that downtime is something to be minimized automated away and measured with strict SLOs. You might be expecting me to bring up error budgets and talk about how their use gave us crucial insight into our production systems. Instead, I'm going to talk about control. It's really quite simple. To mitigate the risk of the next night capital, you need to be able to stop trading. And to do that, you need complete control over your environment. It's worth keeping in mind that the scales I'm talking about are probably a bit different to what most of you are used to. We're not a web services firm with millions of users globally. We don't have clients who'll complain if we have an outage. Our measures of success are not easily defined by an availability metric. Knight Capital likely had close to 100% uptime over those crucial 45 minutes and lost over $155,000 a second. So how do we achieve this level of control? Our SREs control how and when all changes are applied to production. Every change is explicit and reviewed by a human. We retain complete control about what's deployed into production while supporting mass rollouts and responding quickly in the event of new releases. 
Our trading applications are written in-house under the principle of minimal complexity. We have a selection of core libraries that handle general use cases, for example, market data flows or execution, and build on top of those to avoid reinventing the wheel and allow us to customize to an exchange's protocol. This simplified trading stack allows for clear ownership of components and means we always have a specific developer to go to if we need help with a particular application. Our traders converse directly with developers to request features or discuss application behavior, so SREs aren't sat in the middle if we don't need to be. We configure our hardware exactly to our needs, allowing our applications to process and transmit information at the lowest latencies possible. We have physical and virtual kill switches in place to stop trading activity if our applications become unresponsive. I'm sure you're wondering how you automate at all with these constraints. How can we remain agile and respond quickly to changes in market conditions if every change has to be reviewed by a human? How do we balance our fail hard principle against an environment with an immediate opportunity cost to any downtime? Firstly, our developers release regularly to ensure we're not introducing too much change into our environment at once. We manage over 14,000 releases a year. We favor simplicity over excessive tooling and seek company-wide solutions in order to maintain, maintain consistency across the firm. Our assisted deployment upgrade looks for any new releases daily, decides which components are eligible for upgrade and publishes a pull request for us. My team review these every afternoon and decide what can and can't be deployed. We have over 600 binaries in production due to the need to customize per exchange. So this makes sure we're up to date with the latest versions. Altogether, we facilitate over 35,000 changes per year to over 10,000 highly customized components. We have automatic validation on all production pull requests, which checks for anything in the broader environment that might be impacted by a particular change. We've developed a housekeeper application that runs checks on specific aspects of our configuration to ensure our, our applications are performing op optimally. We routinely add new checks when needed and Housekeeper runs company-wide to ensure we have consistency across the board. And above all, if something isn't working and we're finding ourselves performing more manual steps than usual, we change our process. We may add a new component to assisted deployment or suggest a change in release practices with our developers. We're almost at the end of our talk, but there's a bit more to the story here. As I'm sure many of you will have experienced, all the technology principles in the world aren't going to help if the culture isn't behind them. Aligning our production environment with business goals and, and enables a deep understanding of our business model across the whole company. Our control functions are part of mandatory training for all new joiners, and people understand the implications of a failure if they see something wrong. This broad understanding of expected application behavior allows for clear communication between all teams and aligned goals mean there are few disagreements around what work should be prioritized. It also develops well-rounded engineers who understand both our business and technological environments. This approach is invaluable. It means we don't have to explain to our Unix team why a particular box is important. They already know. Our networks team understand the implication if we lose redundancy on an exchange-facing connection. Our traders have a high-level understanding of our production environment so they can quickly react during an outage. And more importantly, we sit with them on the trading floor so we can give regular updates. Trading and tech summaries are included in daily firm updates. Our team leads have regular meetings with trading team leads. We're on the same page. I hope I've gotten you to think differently about SRE. I hope I've made you understand that there's more to reliability and automation than meets the eye. And most importantly, that none of the principles of SRE should come at the expense of retaining control, how failing is essential, and how humans will always have a role in preventing disasters. If you want to learn more about our approach to SRE, please drop by our virtual booth to say hi. Thank you for listening, and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions.